Thank you, Shannon. Uh, well, thank you for the great conference, and I uh, hope you can uh, give us a chat later about uh, how you go about describing all the experiences. Uh, it's kind of what I'm interested in, too, and this project will be slightly related to how to describe experiences. So, um, this is a project that I've been um, engaging with my colleague Alex Spears uh, in the University of Bristol, and he's kind of like the man scientist of this project who built um, this device in his uh, bedroom, and this is it. So, uh, after the talk, uh, you're free to um, have a go and, and feel, it, feel it out. So, we call it the inactive torch, and it's a sensory substitution device. Um, so, just to give a brief outline of this talk, uh, in the beginning uh, I want to talk a little bit about the motivations of uh, why we built this device. Um, and then I will go into some of the design aspects and some of the experiments that we've been doing. And then I'll conclude with some um, suggestions of where we're going to take this next. So, uh, the, the broad context uh, of this device is um, that uh, recently in the cognitive sciences we have something um, of a paradigm shift going on, which um, essentially started with the publication of this book called The Embodied Mind. And uh, um, instead of boring you with all the details, um, I'm going to try to demonstrate the main message of this book with a little experiment. So, um, just grab this, right, and um, tell me what is the texture like. So, what is the texture like? It's all just soft. And it's soft. Okay, yeah. It's Okay, yeah, that, that's fine, brilliant. So if you had a look at his hand, um, what he was doing while he was trying to perceive the texture was moving his hand around, squishing it, right, so moving it around like that. And then that's basically the, the paradigm example that uh, this approach to uh, cognitive science says we do for all perception, which is basically um, an embodied um, active exploration of the environment. Whereas before, it was the task of receiving of information that was the object of perception. Now it's kind of the other way around. And the uh, act of embodied movement is now playing an important role. So another source of evidence for this approach um, comes from sensory substitution devices because it was found out that in order to actually be able to use one of them, like for example the, the tongue one that we saw earlier today, is that you actually have to be able to guide the device with your own hand. If someone holds the camera for you and, and moves around the room and gets a sensation in your tongue, let's say, um, you won't really be able to make out what's going on. There has to be a correlation between the action and the sensations that you're getting. So, um, actually, one of the earliest devices that uh, was doing this was developed in the uh, early 1960s by Bakirita and his colleagues, and it was called the Tactile Vision Substitution System, TVSS. And um, as you can see in the picture of the uh, top right, basically you had a tactile array of stimulators on your stomach or on your back, which were hooked up to a, a camera. So this is one of the earlier devices until the, before they um, developed the thing with the tongue. And after um, some extensive training, people were able to navigate novel environments, um, they were able to read simple text, um, and even distinguish um, different faces. Um, so that's, that's pretty good already, but what really caught the attention of uh, the cognitive scientists was that um, spontaneously subjects would report that they would have a presence of space when they were using it, as if there was some sort of special um, spatial mode of perceptual awareness. So just to give you an example from uh, their paper, uh, Dr. Rita writes, our subjects spontaneously report the external localization of stimuli and that sensory information seems to come from in front of the camera rather than from the viral attackers on their back. Um, so that's the kind of descriptions that you get in the literature. But it turns out that if there's very little agreement about what that experience is really like. Some people say that it's like touch, some people say it's like vision, because obviously you can use it to engage in um, things that require vision normally. And some people argue that because there's uh, this technology involved, um, it's actually a new perceptual modality. Um, so what's important about this debate is that traditionally, um, 
the way to go about answering the question, you know, what is it, the touch is the vision, is to look at the abilities of the subject, um, and as well as the verbal reports. That is, uh, the my third person um, data. So it's not that the experimenter has anything to do with it, he's just looking at the subject uh, um, out there and uh, gathering some information. But um, it turns out that there's a problem because nobody can agree, based on those sources of information, what it's really like. So Noe, who wrote a, a quite a popular book recently called Action and Perception, said that this experience should be fully visual or vision-like to some extent. Then uh, Bob says, well, there's doubt about that. Maybe it's spatial perception by a tactile sensation. And then Bruce says, well, maybe it's automatic appearance. So something more cognitively oriented. Um, so how would we go about you know, choosing between these different options? Um, and it seems like if we just base our um, data on, on the third person approach, then we can never go beyond educated guesses. And what it seemed to us that it would be much better if the experimenters themselves would also have access to these devices and the philosophers engaged in this debate so that they can experience it themselves and then you know, inform the debate um, using their first person experience. Okay, um, it's not easy to describe experiences, um, as we've seen in the previous talk, and it takes years to, to really become good at it. And um, the special problem with doing it in, for sensory substitution is that, of course, the devices are not generally available to the research community. Um, they're not normally commercially available, they're quite expensive, they require a lot of training. Um, so we thought that you know, if we want to get this debate off the ground and, and really get to grips with what's going on when we use these devices, it would be better to start with a device that would be effortlessly replicated by the research community, um, it would be non-intrusive, um, it would be simple to learn so you could just pick it up and start experimenting with it. Um, but you know, of course it still needs to generate interesting results. And uh, it's from this context then that we developed the inactive torch. Now the device, the Adam's Torch, is actually based on an older device called the Haptic Torch, which um, my colleague Adam Spears developed at the University of Reading for line navigation. And um, the Inactive Torch basically developed out of that um, with a focus on how to study perception. So the original motivation for the Haptic Torch was that um, the, the, the most used, uh, we call, we almost call it a sense of substitution device by the line, is the cane, but it has certain shortcomings because um, essentially you have to make physical contact with an object in your environment in order to know it's there. Um, and since you don't want to hit people and cars, um, what you usually do is you keep it quite close to your body. But of course, if uh, an active corporate science is right, it says, well, you know, it's the active exploration of the environment, the embodied action, which really constitutes perception, then that's of course a bad thing. What we want is uh, for them to be able to explore the environment freely. Um, and uh, just, just to give a little bit of an introduction to what used to be done in order to um, solve uh, line navigation, here's some uh, prototypes. And what the generic is done is we have a big uh, computer somewhere which represents the whole environment uh, um, in front of the person, um, and then somehow you know, converts it to audio, like a voice talking and saying um, what's around you and so on. But as you can see from the pictures, these are quite bulky, heavy, and complex, um, and just generally quite impractical. So what we want is something that you know, encourages exploratory movement. So this is a picture of the haptic torch. Well, a little anecdote actually about the name, uh, the torch. Uh, we just had a famous professor visiting uh, the University of Sussex, and we told him, here, here this is the inactive torch. And he was like, are you carrying the Olympic torch for the inactive movement in cognitive science? And we were I was kind of confused until I realized that in the States, of course, the torch is actually you know, something with fire, whereas in England, the torch is a flashlight, what they would call it. So it's a little bit of confusion there, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, in any case, um, so it's a very simple device. It only has one sensor, which is an ultrasonic sensor, so it works kind of like bat echolocation, which uh, measures the distance to objects around you when you point at them, and it has uh, uh, one tactile output. And, uh, with that, you can measure um, the distance. Now, the traditionalist would say, well, with one, only one channel of information, you know, how could anybody make sense of the environment just using that? 
But it turns out that even in vision, even though we have this feel that we have a complete detailed uh, view of the world when we look outside, what really happens is that when we look around, our eyes saccade around and pick out certain bits of interest. And it's just that because wherever we look, actually yes, that's where I focus and that's where we get the detail from. That's how we build up the picture. Um, uh, and, and it's not completely represented as a model in our mind. So we basically said, okay, the haptic torch can do the same. Wherever you point it, you know, it picks up the source of interest and hopefully you'll build up a, um, a, a presence of the world that way. So this is a, a little video of the, the haptic torch. Um, it has a little dial on the top which tells you how far things are. I mean, this video might look familiar to people who play computer games. Um, so you can see the, the dial at the top moving around depending on, on, on on the distance. Um, then we had uh, uh, a friend of ours at uh, the University of Reading try it out. We said, okay, find the lamppost and we blindfolded him. And of course, you can imagine if you had a cane, how would you know which direction to go in? Right? Because unless you make physical contact, there's, there's no information there. But nevertheless, uh, with little training, um, you managed to find it quite quickly. <laughs> Um, and then we did uh, well, added some uh, experiments uh, with an actual blind subject as well. Again, with minimal training, just telling him, please uh, um, find the hole. And you can see that he himself is surprised at how easy that was. Um, so the inactive torch builds on this device, but we incorporated a couple of things so that we can um, study the way it uh, constitutes perception a little bit better. So we have a, a, a link, for example, to the PC, so we can look at the, the, the data that's being generated. And we also added some other outputs, uh, and my favorite of that is that it can also vibrate in your, in your hand now, it's, it's not just the dial. So this is what the device looks like. Um, just at the bottom right, you have a little uh, diagram of uh, reading. When you sw we sweep the um, an active torch around, and you can see that um, there's something farther away, and then as you come to the middle, something is close, and then there's something further away uh, again. So the environment is basically this. We swooped around the chair, and there's a box in the middle, so you can see kind of uh, how the reading uh, correlates with the environment. And then we did a couple of experiments um, where we asked subjects who were blindfolded again after minimal training just to navigate the environment, um, pick up a little box of donuts that they were boarding in. Uh, and then come back, and they were also able to do that quite successfully. So it looks like we've got something here, right? We're, we're back at uh, where Bafirita was. It's basically we got some kind of navigational ability after very minimal training. It's non intrusive, right? And you don't need to stick anything anywhere. Um, and, but we were also interested, of course, in does it generate the experience? And what is the experience like of, of using the device? And just from the very rudimentary investigations of, of uh, asking the subject after that experiment, um, we got some promising results. For example, I need that six o'clock net one meter, or um, it stopped feeling like vibration and more like space. So in order to make sense of these uh, reports, um, I decided to um, uh, t test it out myself. So basically one weekend, I kind of locked myself away and just for a couple of hours each day, just try to, the, the, the inactive torch out, uh, exploring my room. And what I found was that at first, you, you pay quite a lot of attention to the stimulus to your hand. I was using this on the, um, the vibration stimulation. Uh, and you kind of like, oh yeah, okay, now that's further away, okay, that's closer. Um, but quite quickly, um, you pick up on the invariances. So for example, if I had a corner um, and I sweep around like this, then the intensity would be greater and then decrease again. So you get this kind of spike in intensity. And once you realize that that's what a corner feels like, you're quite adept at picking up elsewhere in your room. And you, you really had an aha moment where I turned around and was like, yeah, I recognize that. I opened my eyes, yeah, it was uh, another corner sticking out from the wall. Um, what's interesting is that it doesn't, it doesn't end there, but actually, once you train a little bit more, when you sweep around an obstacle, it feels a little bit like something's impeding your wrist, right? As if you were kind of brushing against something. And of course, you know, your wrist moves freely. So there is some sort of um, uh, spatiality being uh, constituted there through the interaction with the device. 
So my, my feeling is that, yeah, let's try to push this minimal approach as far as we can. It's only got one channel, only got one output, but because of this, you know, being able to explore actively and circadian around the environment, if we get really expert level at using it, you know, perhaps couldn't we start feeling the texture of the world as if you were you know, brushing your hand around the environment? Okay, and finally, uh, I just want to point out some uh, of the things that we made, uh, might have in store. Um, is, of course, the original motivation was to build this device so that we can give it to all the philosophers and cognitive science and say, hey, you've been talking about this for ages, but you've never actually tried one. Well, have a go and, and you know, tell us what you think. Um, and then, of course, we can start also um, playing with the device itself. So the problem, of course, is when you investigate something like vision or another sense without technology, uh, intervening it is that it's kind of hard to tweak your vision, right? I mean, you would have to do something inside the brain or something like that. But with this one, for example, what if happens if we change the linear um, translation between uh, distance and sensation to something different, right? Maybe make it steeper function, put a logarithmic function in there. How does that affect your experience of using the device? So we, maybe you can even map out a kind of space of uh, how that uh, relates. And then just to finally relate this to, to this event, um, we are also in, engaged uh, with a group of blind artists, performance artists who are called Extant, um, who are trying to get some funding for a blind theater where the audience, something like this here, would be immersed uh, in a particular environment using these devices to find a way around. Um, and what interests would be of scientific interest in that project would be to see whether the social interaction between the different users makes the experience different. Because what's happened with Bahirita's devices is that often the blind subjects don't actually really feel anything when they see it. So yes, they can recognize the face of their wife or a naked lady or something that they have always wanted to see, but somehow the emotional factor doesn't really manifest. So one suggestion is that it has nothing to do with the resolution of the information that they're getting, but more with the fact that they were isolated in it. They, didn't, they weren't able to share their experiences with other users, you know, compare and contrast uh, what it is like. Um, so perhaps by having several users with this easy to use device interacting, we'll actually see a qualitative change in experience to as when someone uh, learns how to use it alone. So this is uh, ongoing work. This is just uh, the first prototype. We got some funding to, to build some more. Um, so if you're interested to follow um, what's going on with this project, uh, that's our website, an active torch that WordPress.com, and uh, well, thank you for having me here. Thanks. <laughs>